Um, I'll just basically take you through some of the opening moves of the paper as I submitted it, in which I'm basically arguing that Statius is Achilleid is an epic which reinforces and emphasizes um, performative and constructionist conceptions of what gender is. And it's a very, it's, it can be read as a very sort of gender subversive epic in a way. Just by way of a little bit of background, what we're dealing with here is a first century epic which we don't have the entirety of. It's about one and a half books long. We don't, um, he died or didn't get around to finishing the rest of it. So this is coming in a long line of um, sort of epic. Greek and Roman epic, Homer and Virgil and Ovid and whoever else. And we don't know what would have happened if he'd managed to carry on the work, but what we've got deals essentially with this obs obscure tradition which Statius didn't invent about the um, early life of Achilles, but which he was the only time that we've, we have it used um, in literature, uh, Roman literature anyway, where basically um, Thetis, Achilles' um, immortal mother, doesn't want him to die and at Troy because she knows he's going to, and so she takes him and leaves him on a Greek island while he's still a boy dressed up as a woman, and it all kind of escalates horribly from there. Um, so I'm just going to... Um, so this is a story which, in its base form, um, in, in the sort of ideas in it before you unpack it into a particular narrative. It can be used for a lot of different things. It could be used as a kind of boys will be boys, like progress narrative type, kind of let's just have a mess around with being feminine before we go on and actually kind of achieve our proper, real, masculine, heroic destiny. Or it can be used as exactly the opposite, as a way of taking gender norms and those kind of... Um, traditional ideals and actually completely messing with them and showing that they're not as, as innate or whatever else as, as they might pretend to be. Um, I'm, to give you a bit of a flavour of what I mean by this, and I apologise for the, the large amount of text on screen today, probably a little bit easier than me just reading it out, um, I'm just going to take you through this one simile which occurs quite near the beginning of the poem, which I think is basically uh, a key to understanding the whole thing. Essentially, now this is um, the point where Thetis is reclothing Achilles and, cha and teaching him how to dress as a woman and to move as a woman and changing his hair and sort of all the rest of it. And she's, this is expressed, Stacia chooses to express this as a, a sculptor um, creating a, a wax um, object. So, so the, the Latin is, is that first bit up there. Um, so it's, a, it's an image which very much emphasizes the power and the, and the kind of controlling uh, generative aspect which uh, changing the dress has over him. So it becomes quite a big deal <coughs> in, in this simile. Now what's interesting about this is how closely it resembles textually, and it's a lot more obvious in the Latin, the, um, a passage of Ovid's Metamorphoses, that's the second bit on there, where Ovid is basically describing the Pygmalion myth the story of the sculptor who um, creates this beautiful statue of a woman and um, it comes, it's so beautiful and he's so skilled but it comes alive and he falls in love with it. So as you, I've, I've tried to underline the particularly similar bit, the, um, um, the, word, the word for shape is the same in both times, there's a focus on sort of hands and fingers in both and with one of them it's with wondrous art and the other one the, per the, the person is compared to to an artist. So Statius is deliberately setting up this kind of intertextual link. Now what does he gain from doing this? I want to suggest that what this adds is that it draws attention to the fact that this, in, this exterior change, um, this bodily reinscribing, has a level, has meaning beyond the physical and it causes meaning beyond the physical because that's what's going on in the Pygmalion myth. Um, because, as everybody knows, the reshaping of the, the stone into the statue causes it to take on a human heart and flesh and human feelings. So it, it suggests that there's something going on beyond just changing clothes, and, but, transfer, but this cross-dressing means more than just kind of like it would for the people who go out on rugby socials in drag, say. Um, but 
what makes this particularly interesting is how closely that, that idea resembles Esther Newton's analysis of drag queens in her 1972 work, Mother Camp, Female Impersonators of America. Esther Newton basically went around a load of underground, illegal, sort of gay and drag clubs and sort of watched a lot of drag shows and, and this kind of thing. And her analysis of drag is this, but it's this really complex thing which simultaneously expresses these two different gendered statements where, on the one hand, drag says, the dra a drag queen, by presenting herself in that, himself, in that sense, um, says, my outside appearance is feminine because I'm dressed as a woman, but simultaneously my, um, my essence, something underneath that is masculine because my body is very masculine, and in a drag show you're never allowed to forget that. But simultaneously the drag queen says, my appearance outside is masculine because you can see my masculine body, and, but simultaneously, my essence, something within that, is feminine. Because there's something that makes, within me that makes me want to dress up as a woman. I am, I am weird. I'm queer. There's something, not, um, there's something slightly not normatively right about me. Um, Judith Butler takes this and, um, 20 years later and uses it to form this kind of slightly more thoroughgoing uh, theory of the formative gender. Um, Butler says, gender is a construction that regularly conceals its genesis. And what, what drag is doing is it's saying, look at, look, look at this lack of genesis. Um, look at how constructed all of this is, because I can mess about with it so much. And I reckon that's what's going on. And that's what Statius is deliberately suggesting is going on in the um, accolade by using this artisan simile. <coughs> so he constructs a kind of meta-literary drag show because the people on the island don't know that um, Achilles is a man, but the reader, of course, isn't allowed to forget it. Um, so they're very conscious of that, that genesis that I <coughs> mentioned earlier. And the, from there, that's just at the, the beginning. From there, it just gets weirder. Um, and there's all, um, there's all sorts of other implications that, um, that, that come out of this, especially at this moment, much later on, where Achilles ends up sort of picking up weapons and kind of becomes a man, like it starts performing as a man again and, and the, the takes, takes the female clothes off. Because, of, because this kind of performative dynamic has been suggested, you wonder, the reader is left to wonder if Achilles can ever be a man again and, um, and whether, and whether that, that normative performance can ever be kind of um, re, reset in a way. Um, so yeah, that's that's mainly what I had to say about that. The um, I think this is what I, I've just sort of given you a flavour of one of the many ways in which I think the accolade can be read as an epic that emphasises performative gender in some really kind of anti-normative, subversive ways. And please fire some questions at me, but at the sorts of questions that you asked Tom about um, about drag and uh, men writing drag, um, things like that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Do you want to come in? Do you want, do you want to come in while, while we're asking questions? Yeah, we're well, yeah. <laughs> So, are there any questions? <coughs> yes. Um, do you think you need to be like, careful or aware of the problematic nature of applying like, the idea of drag queens to something written so long ago as it can be attached to the context sort of anarchist? I think you need to be very careful of it, but uh, and there's a there's a um, there's a point at which you could take it too far, but at the same time I think you can do it unproblematically. Um, one angle you can take on this is a very kind of a reader response orientated viewpoint, saying that you know we are reading from our own 20th, 20th, 20th century, 21st century point of view, and that is just how things are, and we cannot get out of that. How, however much we, we might try, and there's almost no point trying. Um, the other, the other uh, issue is that um, we, don't really, we don't really have any, any other terminology. The terminology in, in classical culture is very, very limited. I mean, there's not even a word for lesbian, for God's sake. Like, you, have to, you have to bring in some terminology or you just shut down huge swathes of the debate, which just isn't useful. Um, and um, 
I think there's also there's also an element to which you can suggest that uh, bringing in bringing in these things kind of um, shows the uh, it sort of helps you conceptualise the level of subversiveness that these things could have had, partly because the terminology isn't there. Does that, does that answer your question? Cool. Great. Any more questions? Yeah. Just to support you on this, <laughs> um, I think one of the, I read your um, thesis and. Loved it, and um, the reason why your your invocation of the term drag queen is not problematic is because you don't argue that Achilles identifies himself as a drag queen, or Statius mm. does not identify Achilles as a drag queen. Um, in the same way that they, that the reason they didn't have a word for a lesbian mm. was because they didn't have people identifying themselves as people that exclusively yeah. uh, are attracted to the opposite sex. Um, so that's that's why I find it yeah. anachronistic. That's really interesting. On the on the issue actually um, of people uh, of, of men men writing writing women and men creating female experience, there's a really interesting point in this in this epic because you know this is um, an epic written by a man uh, uh, about a man who messes around with being a woman. Um, there's a bit where and, and it, again with these kind of intertextual links, and um, you can create all sorts of resonances. By, by using these things, and which, which would have been very obvious to these kind of illiterate kind of audience. Um, Achilles ends up falling in love with a girl, and they have this sort of like semi-courtship while still, while he's still dressed as a woman. Um, he ends up putting, Statius very deliberately at certain points puts his narrative in line with some fragments of Sappho that we have, and Sappho is like the lesbian author in antiquity par excellence. Um, so, <coughs> I, it's, it's interesting as, as possibly as one way of trying to solve this problem of as a man, can you write women, of putting, putting your narrative very deliberately in line with an intertext which, which does, which can um, convey women identified experience. Um, <coughs> I was wondering to what extent you could authentically read the accolades in a subversive way, in the sense that I think some of the reasons we might find it subversive today simply weren't there at the time of his writing. I think you have biblical stories, you've got you know non-Western um, epics, you've got Western epics, you've mm -hmm. got stories written since, which involve a lot of this. And I think perhaps we almost need to get to have a Victorian mindset to suddenly go, mm -hmm. what? They can't do this. But would it? You know, was it unique for its time? Um. The narrative itself is fairly unique for its time. Um, I think partially this this comes back to uh, our uh, the thing I said of, of um, reading from reading from one's own one's own point of view, and the paper itself is is very much kind of written in that vein. I I just don't know. You know, he's he's very deliberately um, he's very deliberately writing against some earlier versions of the same story. There's there's some Ovid Ovid writes a version of um, the story that's a lot more kind of gender essentialist straight down the line. And it's very obvious that Statius is responding to that. So and it I think it it would be very hard to to suggest that there's no element of gender constructionism it, um, suggested by what happens in the epic, or at least that it's quite ambiguous and the meaning is sort of potentially in there. Um, would it have come across as subversive at the time? Well, maybe.